So cult brands. So what is it about cult brands? Um, I talk about cult brands with clients all the time, and they all say, yeah, I want to be a cult brand. It's like, well, you can't just be a cult brand. You can't just make that happen. Because cult brands are really about having the opportunity to have customers that are something other than just customers. And they're actually customers who are beyond fans. They're fanatics. Okay? They're the kinds of fanatics that, frankly, are the epitome of what brand love could ultimately mean. They're the kinds of fans, the kinds of customers who will sleep out all night long on the sidewalk to be first in line to buy, the, to, give them, to give you their money for this product. And they will, they will, they will give up their whole night to do it. Um, they're the kinds of fans and fanatics who will tattoo your, lo their, your logo on their bodies. They're the kinds of fans, if I can click this, who will go to jail on behalf of your product. This is a quote from a gentleman who broke into a Wells Fargo bank to heat up his hot pocket. <laughs> So if, if that's the case, um, how do brands do this? How do brands create that kind of affinity, that kind of love, that kind of affection and passion? And um, the reality is that these brands don't have anything that your brands don't have. But they do understand the, the, the secret power of the charms that are involved in, in capitalizing on that. So we've sort of organized. When I think about this and I study brands, it became really clear that there are some ways that we can inventory the things that all of our brands have and figure out how do we exploit them in ways. And the best way to do this is to go through it. So I'm going to walk you through this little model, and we're going to use lots of examples. There's more examples that I could fit into this time slot that they gave me. So I'm going to go fast, but I want you to know there's tons more, and you'll be able to recognize your own brands within this. I promise you, you will see stuff in here, and you'll go, oh, yeah, my brand is one of those. So, Excuse me, CHARMS is an acronym, um, and we're going to walk through it. Um, the first is a creed, the second is history, the third is an arch enemy. We're going to have fun with that one. We're going to talk about rituals, we're going to talk about marks, and we're going to talk about secrets. All brands have these things at their disposal. Many of them have lots of them. Cult brands leverage them, they exploit them, and they, fuel, they put kerosene on the fire of these things when they, when they show up in the public. So let's go through them one by one, creed. So creed, we all have mission statements, we all have purposes, we all spend a lot of time in positioning. What we really want to do is figure out how can we codify our belief system in a way that everybody who works for our company or people who interact with us recognize with consistency what it means to work. This is Nike's creed. It's not public facing. It showed up publicly in the, in, the, in the Air movie this year and I saw it and I went, oh yeah, because I've seen that sheet of paper from 1970 seven, literally typewritten like that. Just look at a few of those things. We're on offense all the time. Um, live off the land. Your job isn't done until the job is done. It won't be pretty. And finally, if we do the right things, we'll make money damn near automatic. This is the mantra by which Nike built its business. All of their internal stakeholders, was, it was codified. They knew what they were expected to do internally. Patagonia, they're so confident in their creed, they paint it on the side of buildings, okay? It says Patagonia's creed, build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, use business to inspire and implement solutions to environmental crisis. They're not just saying what we believe in for ourselves, they're telling all of us what we believe in so you can decide whether to love us or frankly hate us because a cult brand knows that it needs rabid followers and they can't please everybody in order to do that. These are the kinds of things that a really well-articulated creed can inspire in terms of actions the brand's going to take, whether it's uh, sewing messages uh, during election season inside the tags of their shirts, or building a, a buyback program, or basically a, a whole program that says, we actually don't want to sell you a jacket because it's not good for the environment. Please keep using the one you already have, or we'll repair it for you, or please donate it. That is, that is the creed, that is the um, articulation of the creed into action that customers can appreciate and see every day and decide to love you and follow you as a brand. This is a world famous creed that became so well articulated, it became a campaign. I'm not gonna read it to you. It's already been read way better than I'll ever read it by uh, Richard Dreyfuss um, as he, uh, as he uh, laid out the Think Different campaign for, for Apple uh, back in the day. There's one little note there. It says, we make tools for these kinds of people. That's not in the spot. We make tools for these kinds of people. That is the belief system articulated, written down, so everybody knows what it is, and what's our business role in all of this. What's more important, though, is in this particular example, 
um, this was a testament not just to what Apple believed as a company, it actually tapped into the, the soul of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, sorry, we're gonna go back. Uh, Steve Jobs was so, like saw himself in this. You can tell Steve Jobs was, like saw this and went, that's me, I wanna be remembered like this. So he was so um, impassioned with this that he insisted that he also do a voiceover cut, in case you don't know that, of the, of the Think Different spot. Um, they smartly ran the Richard uh, Dreyfus version. But, but if you've never heard it, I'm gonna play it for you right now. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. I can only speak for myself, but that's a cult I believe in. That's a cult that I actually want to belong to. I don't know if there are others in the room, but for me, like it stirs my soul, both historically and as a creative person, that, that I love that. I love that story, and, and I think it's an excellent example of what we're talking about and creating belief systems and then codifying them so others can understand what you stand for. Let's move on to something a little lighter, history. You all have history. Your brands all have a starting point. You have a, an origin story. You have a creation story, and creation stories are powerful. And the reason they're powerful is because in most cases, it represents the humble beginnings of what a company was or the brilliant insight that led to what has become a brand today that we're all managing. A lot of them started in places, frankly, garages. I don't know what it is about garages. My garage is full of crap. But apparently, uh, Apple, Mattel, um, Amazon, uh, um, Harley Davidson, Disney, they all started in garages. This is HP's garage. Um, and these are the places where things happen and get cooked up and started, and they become the source of legends. Um, sometimes the garage is an apartment in San Francisco where a couple guys realized that they had floor space in their apartment, there was a conference going on, and people couldn't find a hotel room. So they bought three air mattresses, put them on the floor, and fed them Pop-Tarts in the morning, and that became Airbnb. I didn't know this. Like, I actually found this as I was kind of putting this presentation together. I always thought air. B&B was like, internet, bread and breakfast. You know, like there was some kind of internet air thing. No, no, air mattress. Air mattress. Who knew? What a great story that they should do an even better job of telling. Um, your history and your, your, your origin story is the stuff of who has an About Us page on their website? Come on, you all have an About Us page. And it's probably not the greatest page on your website, right? Use your origin story. Find a way to tell the story about where your company came from, what its beliefs were, what its humble beginnings were. They are things that humanize who we are and allow us to interact with brands at a human level. This is what uh, they have on, this is the opening thought of uh, the Marine Layer page. And I, I love the idea that he started this company. The idea for this company is because his girlfriend kept throwing away his really comfortable shirts he's been wearing for 20 years. He wanted to find really soft shirts that, that had, had been worn in the right way. Sorry. I keep forgetting the videos are in a different uh, folder over there, so it's all good. Um, all right, I'm gonna show you one more uh, origin story. This is a famous one. Uh, it's for Gatorade. If you've never seen this, Gatorade's origin story is so good and so powerful as a brand that they actually made commercials out of the origin story. So here's a master class in it from the uh, early 2000s. The legend was born in 1965 in the storied swamp of Florida, and as befits a legend, it began with a searing question. Coach asked why we didn't go during the game. The players weren't adequately hydrated and their performance suffered. As the Gators marched through the season, they drank a carbohydrate electrolyte beverage created by University of Florida doctors. Naturally, we called our stuff Gatorade. In conditions ever make a salamander sweat, the Gators thrive. Those boys drank that stuff and they became a second-half team. 
I saw it in my own two eyes. In 1967, when the Gators won their first Orange Bowl, Gatorade had arrived. Today, Gatorade is the most researched sports drink in the world. And it continues to fuel champions wherever they're found. Humbly born on the hard scrabbled gridirons of Florida, proven by generations of athletes. And just as the games never end, so the legend continues. Okay, so history story. It could just be a simple statement, just a way for the... I, I was at a... Um, I, they will remain nameless. I was at a client meeting, a very big client meeting, uh, very recently, and we were talking about this, this model and creed and history and origin stories, and I had heard an origin story at this client, and one of the senior people said, oh yeah, that's a thing, that happened, and the rest of the staff had no idea that that was the origin story. Like, their own people didn't understand the origin story. Find a way, figure out what it is, how do you romanticize it, make it uh, interesting and dramatic, and, and we'll tell it. All right, here's my favorite. My favorite of the charms is the arch enemy. The arch enemy, you might think of it as your competitor. Competition is, is a business transaction. It's a business uh, dynamic. I'm talking about an emotional disdain for somebody or something or some entity or some other company, something that gives all of your believers a common foe, a common enemy that they can rally behind. The power of a common enemy has, has throughout history uh, been a powerful thing. So we all know the, the Mac, uh, who's a Mac in the room? Who's a PC? Like, I, I already know they're here, right? You self-identify. That's, that's it's, it's, it's as simple as that, right? Um, who's, the, who's, the, who's the arch enemy of Coca-Cola? Right. Who here doesn't have a preference? Exactly. We all have, inside of us, we kind of know which, sorry, I, we all know which one we really are inside. Burger King, its arch enemy is McDonald's. McDonald's. Guess who McDonald's doesn't care about? Burger. Burger King, exactly. So one of the keys to being an arch, uh, identifying an arch enemy, oftentimes it's because you're, you know, you're you're down in the in the uh, in, you're you're not the top dog, right? It's a kind of a um, a, a punching out of your weight class kind of move. Um, right, Marvel, Marvel. Which multiverse do you want to belong to? Which one do you care about? Might be kind of a geeky thing to do, but. You do, if, you're in the, if you're in that target group, you're one or the other for the most part. I can't be in a room like this if I don't do this. What? <laughs> right? It's a layup. But, but think, about, think about the power of that rivalry and arch enemy. So rivalry, here's the thing about rivalry in all of these examples. Rivalry is drama. And drama is storytelling. If you can figure out a rivalry, you can figure out a way to be more dramatic and more compelling in your storytelling. And to the tune of advertising, promotions, merchandising, ticket sales. I mean, th this rivalry is gigantic. We'll be talking about it a little bit more, I'm sure, uh, as the day goes along. And, and look, it's early in the morning, but i got to do this one more time. You guys ready? OH! Oh. That was better. <laughs> not, not, not that much better. Oh, blue. <laughs> thank you. We knew we were going to get one of those. Um, so this moves us from... from uh, uh, from this idea of arch enemies, what you just exhibited was the ritual portion of it. So there was a slide that said ritual, but we're just going to move into this. So rituals are those, those behaviors that we adopt around brands, the ways we, we interact physically or emotionally around brands and that we share it with other people. Uh, whenever we go vote, we all want to put a sticker on. It doesn't matter what the sticker is. We're signifying to the rest of the world that we're part of the club that just went and voted. That's a ritual that we take place every single time we go vote. And rituals take all kinds of uh, forms. Um, we all know this is one of the most famous product rituals on the planet Earth. I don't have to explain what this is. Um, here's another famous product ritual. It's actually two rituals right now. What are they? One's the lime, so that's how you drink the beer, and the other is at the beach. So you drink a Corona at the beach. That's getting into a whole other territory that's a, like it's a master class conversation now when we start to get into mental availability and things around like the context and when the brand's right for you. But the ritual of it is you think about beach, what beer are you having? You're not having a Guinness, you're having a Corona in your brain. Um, you can create these, huh? Yeah, so you can create these. Um, uh, Dairy Queen did a masterful job of reinforcing how thick and uh, uh, substantive their, uh, the Blizzard milkshakes were. Um, and for a while they ran a promotion. If the server did not tip it upside down, you got it for free, right? Yeah, so you, you, I don't, did you get a free one? No. Oh, before your time. Okay, great. But I just looked like, you know, and I got the president of the United States doing it. Like, I, it probably wasn't president at the time. They wouldn't let him in. But um, anyway, 
The other thing about rituals, because we can create them, they can be anything. This is a counter ritual. This took the entire world of Black Friday and REI, true to their brand, said, hell with that. We're going to shut down that day. We're going to give all of our people back the day if they want to go shopping, great. But the point is, as a brand, push people outside. Go outside and enjoy the weather. Enjoy the outdoors. So your brand, you have the ability to, to build these things into culture uh, in ways that maybe you didn't imagine before. Again, we're just trying to take stock and examples, and I hope you're starting to see these in your own world. Okay, marks. Marks, symbols, totems, talismans. These are the symbols that we use to identify ourselves with a group. It's not your logo. I mean, your logo is a symbol. But I'm talking about things that are unofficial, the things that are um, pervasive beyond what you um, create formally. Uh, you do have the ability to create them, but they're not the, they're not the, the corporate endorsed thing. They're the, they're the sign that people believe and rally people around. They are the thing that allow you to self-identify cross room, to see somebody in a black shirt and go, there's the guy in the creative department because we're wearing the same colors. And I know that that guy is too and that guy, I'm, I am literally pointing to people in a creative department <laughs> wearing their black shirts today. Um, you see these all throughout culture, all right? Um, that's the Green Bay Packers. Actually, I just learned this from Brian when I was talking to him. The, the Packers actually just bought the company that makes these foam heads. But the foam heads started as a cult brand following Right? So they just started to manufacture their own cheese heads. Um, that's a tribe you can self-identify with. We can all self-identify with this tribe. I mean, it may not be my tribe, but we know what tribe that is that we belong to. There's, this is a tribe. This is not accidental that there was a totem and a symbol put together to rally believers around the same cause. And that's one of the great things about symbols and marks is that you do have the ability to control them and insert them into culture, insert them into the fandom. This is one of the most famous silhouettes on the planet Earth. It didn't just happen. It happened in 1912 with this design brief that says, a bottle so distinct that it could be recognized by touch in the dark or when lying broken on the ground. That's, that's, that's design intent. That's creating something in the marketplace that you want to start to create resonance around your brand with. Um, how the hell did we get a chicken company <laughs> represented by a cow, right? The great irony, and we all know what that is. Um, and, and that in itself, that what, what you start to also realize is that symbols become rituals, and rituals become um, um, history stories. And so all these things can work together in ways that you may not have thought possible. One of our clients out west, uh, in In-N-Out Burger, famous cult brand, um, Every single In-N-Out restaurant has a pair of palm trees, cross palms planted on the premises. If you didn't know it, you didn't know it. But it's part of their culture. It's part of their store design. I don't know how they're going to do it in Tennessee. We'll find out because <laughs> they're coming, right? I think it's Tennessee. And, uh, but um, every single one of them. And it, it's a symbol. It's a visual representation of their brand. It shows up in all their merchandising in store, but it also shows up in merchandising in their cult catalog. Yes, cult catalog. They have a catalog full of merchandising. And this is what the other great thing about marks and symbols is they fuel merchandising. They fuel ways for people to not just buy in, but buy your product, wear your product. Where's Michael Red Ice? He's wearing his socks today. I don't know why I saw that, Michael, but I was standing in the back and he's wearing his garlic toast socks. He's in and out. Socks. What's that? It's in and out. No, he's wearing, his, he's, wearing, he's wearing some Texas toast socks, I think. Uh, and, you know, all the way down to people using the palms from the cups to their, their biceps and, and, and uh, tattoos on their bodies. All right, here's the last one, shh, secrets. Here's the cool thing about secrets. If you know, you know, and if you don't know, you wanna know, right? You want into the club. So are there any Jeep owners in here? Yeah, so somebody, do, yeah, there's a few of you. If you don't know, you don't know, but I'm telling you, I don't know because I'm not, but if you own a Jeep, there's a wave that Jeep owners give to one another. There's a hierarchy to the wave. It depends on how old the Jeep is, what model it is, frankly, what kind of condition it's in. And whoever has the lower hierarchy, they have to weigh first. Like, it's a whole thing. It's a, it's a system. you got to be trained on this culture. Jeep is masters at this stuff. They actually hide Easter eggs in their cars. They're not uniform everywhere. They're little design flourishes that show up ran seemingly randomly in different places all over the different models. And they become the stuff of discussion and discovery that people share in. Uh, social forums, uh, and, and they're sharing pictures about it, and it just feeds the fandom. Starbucks has given us a secret language 
small, medium, large, forget it. We now have tall, grande, and venti, and every other thing. And, and when we go to Starbucks, it's a whole other secret language that we have to do so that we can understand, so they can make us the proper, um, the proper drink. In-N-Out Burger, again, has a secret menu. They are masters at this. That menu, it changes maybe once a decade, the one that you go into the restaurant to see. But there's a secret menu, actually a not-so-secret secret menu, where you can order things protein style, um, animal style, four by fours, Neapolitan shakes. There's a whole bevy of things that you can get from an In-N-Out Burger that all of the, the staff know how to make, but unless you know how to order it, you won't get it. Snowbird, uh, Lance yesterday, if you were here, started to talk a little bit about Snowbird. It's a legendary extreme ski um, resort. Uh, you don't go there unless you're pretty good at doing this, so you're a little bit death-defying to begin with. Most of, many of the people who go to Snowbird, the fans, the fanatics, right, the people who are Snowbird cult fans, they're not interested in the official map. They're looking for the runs that are super dangerous. They're looking for the runs that aren't on the map. They're looking for the runs that uh, only the staff or the, snow, uh, the, the, the guides or the locals know about. And where do they find them? Reddit. If you're not paying attention to Reddit, that's where your cult following is going to start. It's going to start if you start figuring out how are people talking behind the scenes in the unofficial channels about your brand. So start looking into that. There's one more. So they have one more. Oh, am I long? Yes. Oh, OK, I'm long. <laughs> Only 10 minutes long? Every second. OK, thank you so much. Uh, then we're going to skip the last one. And we're going to bring up the panelists, uh, and we're going to uh, sit down and have a, a further conversation around all of this. Yeah, that's OK. That's if I'm long, we don't get to applaud much. So, oh, great. Uh, Brian Waddell uh, from uh, Hot Pockets and Nestle is going to join us up here. Ryan Morgan from Jenny's Ice Cream is going to join us. And Andy DeVito from Ohio State Athletics running branding up there. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Is everybody's, everybody on? Huh? You really squeeze 30 minutes into a 15 minute session. Good. That's excellent. Yeah. Good creative I told director them I right might there. run long. That's right. I said I might run a little long. They said, that's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I have a thing. They got an agenda. I'm, I'm on. I'm on. It's all good. It's all good. Oh, thanks. So, so look, guys, uh, these guys all represent uh, different brands that are um, cult worthy uh, on their way to being even bigger cults. Um, so I thought one of the things, you know, I'm curious what you guys started to, as you, as you started to think about um, inventorying your own brands, you know, what were the, what were the things that you guys saw in them? Um, I guess maybe I'll start with, with you, um, Ryan. Any of, the, any of the charms that kind of started to, to make sense to you as a... Is this thing on? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> talk about rituals for a moment. Yeah, rituals. Wherever there's a Jenny's, there are tour guides. Tour guides are our most dedicated fans. Early adopting, in the know, tastemakers, likely the first to discover our shops when we open, the people who love to bring in their friends for the first Jenny's experiences. They know everything about the company. They take off work for flavor drops. Their friends text them for recommendations. They drive trial and awareness. And so when we open up in a new community, neighborhood, we're looking to identify where our tour guides. Great. This is behavior they're already doing organically. How can we make it easier for them? So to you, do or, it? you organize them that way? Or you yeah. invite them in? Or we, how does, yeah, how do it's you like, let's identify them. <clears throat> let's build a relationship and just make it easier for them to do that. Great. How do you do, do you do similar things in the digital space with Hot Pockets? Yes and no. Yeah. Um, especially with rituals. So we are a snacking brand, which snacking is 24-7, 365, especially to our core consumer, which is a 17-year-old teen boy, which is... That's a lot have, of rituals. Anybody have teens, in, <laughs> right? Um, and so, as you know, when they're hungry, they're hungry. Right? You can't kind of wait, and for some families, right, having indulgent flavor experiences yeah. can be a bit of a stretch. So we'd like to say, like, if we are that ritual, if we are that moment, how can we kind of embody a greater spirit that is less just about snacking our form, our equity, and more sort of a mindset or a philosophy, a philosophy? And so recently we've started to embody this mantra of being unexpectedly hot. Right? It is who we are in our nature, but in order to like, break free from the Doritos and some of our competitors that live in ambient snacking or even akin to us in the junk drawer in your freezer section, 
Um, you have to be different. You have to dare to be different. You have to be very unexpected, which for a company like Nestle can be a little interesting with conversations we have to have internally, but it allows you to do big things, yeah. uh, whether that is you know, cargo shorts that have a hot pocket in them and generate over 1.6 billion impressions in a two-week period versus what we just announced this past week with our partnership with the Hot Ones that's coming up just to try to bring new things into the market. Yeah, the Hot Pocket shorts, I'm gonna order a pair. If you haven't seen them yet, they're pocket shorts. You gotta get them on eBay. Huh? Get them on, you gotta get them on eBay now, where all the, all the good merch is. How about rituals at, at Ohio State and pageantry and all of the things that go into that? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm sure most are familiar with a lot of that stuff already, but um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the OH, like you just mentioned, I mean, that's always a big one. You go anywhere, you, you say OH, you know, you're gonna get that I.O. pack. Um, you know, at Ohio State, I mean, we, we really pride ourselves on connections. Um, as we build out our brand and what we try to do is, is really create that connection between our student athletes, is, which, which is our focus um, with, our, with our fans. And I think that's what really draws people to come to our games. It's, yeah, maybe we're the top 10 in the country and whatever it is, and that's great, but you know, how can you create that connection to our student athletes? Because that's what really matters to them. You know, I always go back to Aaron Kraft with basketball. He was one of the most likable guys you could ever see, and, and, and people loved him. And I think, truly, people came to watch him play just because of his attitude, of his, you know, charisma and everything else that he brought to it. So, um, you know, the rituals is a, is a big part of what we do. I mean, crossing out the M's during TTUN, right? You know, TTUN, that's another secret with, with Ohio yeah. State. Not a secret, but, you no, know. No, it's a secret. It's, I think it totally qualifies. It is, it is. So... Um, when you look at those different things, it's really how do you continue to utilize those and see what our audience are, are, are creating and, and adapting to, and how do you continue does, as a brand? Does everybody know what he just said? TTUN? Okay. And you know about crossing out the M's? Okay, I'm just yeah. making sure. Like, if you're not from the area, <laughs> there are no M. Everything's crossed out during Michigan Week. Yeah. And during and our, uh, and that team up North our, Week. Our facility crew hates it because it's <laughs> taped up there, and they have to go and put it, take it down and everything, so that's, that's a whole other story. But when you come on campus, it's, it's funny you see all that stuff, so... Um, cool. But yeah, the rituals are, are you know, uh, uh, really built Fuels into our brand, so. I was, uh, uh, I'm really curious, like uh, uh, Ryan and I were talking at one point, and we were talking about origin stories. Do you mind sharing, like, the thought of uh, how did origin stories impact, like, where, where Jenny's came from, and how did, how did sort of the artisanal flavor sort of come to be? Well, it's a, it's a core part of, of who we are today. Uh, we're called Jenny's for a reason. That's because there's actually a Jenny. In 1996, at the age of 22, as an art student obsessed with scent and perfuming, she had a, a habit blending essential oils. One day, she takes cayenne essential oil and puts it in chocolate ice cream and serves it to her friends. And it's cold at first, and it's sweet, and then it's hot, and your throat is on fire. And she sees the response the emotional response in her friends. And she's like, that's the moment where here is a white space where people are not really doing interesting things. And we can drive something that's gonna uh, drive different customer behavior. Um, and so that story is core to who we are and that, that vision that she had then of, of doing something new, creating a new standard in ice cream is what we still do today. All right, let's talk about, like, uh, uh, Brian started talking about his shorts. Not his shorts. Well, I don't know. He might have a pair. But, but the idea of merchandising, the idea of how do we continue to fuel the fandom with merchandising, and what are the kinds of symbols and reinforcements of the brand, even when it's more informal? I'm just curious. Like, I know, obviously, Ohio State's a, I mentioned a cult catalog with, like, in and out Burger. You guys have stores. Like, you guys are, like, like go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, it's funny because merchandising, so within MySpace, it's, it's, we're all about the branding and the creative, right? So now we've been really partnering with our trademark and licensing team, our key account manager, and really finding ways that we can connect not only the creative part, but also how does that expand over to the merchandising aspect. So it really hasn't been done before. So the past couple of years, we started getting this collaboration a little bit more. And, you know, it's, it's really cool to see because, you know, just recently, you know, we've got some of my designers in, 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 the studio here, um, it's like opening day for baseball and softball. I mean, that really hasn't been a thing, but our bosses always challenge us, how can we really make that something? So one of our tasks as, as a creative department is, yes, we create the visuals and the, and, and the branding and so forth, but how do you carry that on to the merchandise? How do you carry that on to other touch points and experiences within our audience? So opening day was one area where 
we really never tapped into. Yes, baseball major league opening day is huge. Why can't we carry that down into the, the college space? So Emily Holt, who's here, you know, she helped create the mark, and we started creating this, this affinity for opening day. And it was just the first year last year that we did it, but we're going to continue it every year. So hopefully, again, that's something that our, our fans can, can get a hold of and so forth. Um, and, you know, I mean, other areas as far as merchandising is, you know, Stadium 100, if you guys were familiar with that last year, we did a full campaign, one of our probably most successful campaigns that we've done. We have a huge, a huge uh, merchandising, you know, arm that we really created within that. And that's really working with our trademark and licensing team, working with our key accounts, you know, partners on what we want this to be, how do we have our fans connect to the stadium? I mean, one of the most iconic stadiums in, in the country. Um, and build out that affinity with them. And what does that look like for the different marks and, 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 and so forth? So yes, the mark is one area of it, but then how do you continue to expand on that mark and tell the stories? And I think that's an area that we really focus on is that connection, that storytelling within our brand. So um, I think it's great. I think, I think one of the things also that I've learned in working with, with different brands like this, and, and I know I, I, I want to tee this up, uh, there's a certain amount of loss of control that you have to be willing to give up as a brand steward. I'm looking at some of my friends who are in charge of the brand standards. Um, you know, if you want fans to create on your behalf and take your brand on for themselves, you, 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 yeah. you got to give it up a little bit, that's, right? That's, that's right. It. And your business is not your brand. Uh -huh. And that's a very hard statement, especially at Nestle, steeped in history, culture, the whole nine. Um, but the real about Hot Pockets is we're 40 years old. I'm 40 years old. I don't eat Hot Pockets. Right? It's not a part of my daily life, but it is for teens every day. And so we've had four generations of teenagers who have come through this brand that change every 12 months. One cohort goes out, the next cohort comes in. But the vast majority of the consumers who have engaged with us haven't eaten us in the last 10, 15 years. And it's a very real statement, right? It's not a nostalgia play. It's some other things. They remember the brand for what it looked like back in the 90s versus the incredible branding work we've done today. So the only way to get that out there to allow it to permeate more is to give up or relinquish control and trademarks, IP. That freaks the lawyers out, right? It's the last thing you want to do because it opens up opportunity that they view as risk. But at the same time, there's another side of that coin where there's a plentiful, bountiful area in space. By just giving up, you can get so much more in return. And over the past two years, we've been able to work with an incredible series of artists that have taken our marks, even our character in Herbie that we've known internally for 25 years where if I ask anybody who's eat the product, they're like, you, you have a mascot, right? That's a problem. And so how you bring that into culture is not by our design and intent, but truthfully those that live with the brand every single day. I can only imagine that the OSU uh, cringes sometimes when they see what fans create on their behalf, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that's something that I've been accustomed to where, all right, I see something, I've got to... Yeah. I can't always control it, you know, it, it is what it is, I mean, with, with the, the amount of audience we have out there, but, you know, I go back to saying they can create their own things, they're selling our brand, you know, I mean, that's a great thing. They're, they're putting their brand out there, we don't have to do it, they're doing it on their own, so, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's really cool to see sometimes what is being created, because sometimes, like, why the hell did I think of that, because that is awesome, you know, so, uh, but yeah, we take some inspiration from some different things that our audience have created. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's good, but you know, they're, they're still supporting the brand. Their, their intention is to be part of that loyalty and be part of that pride, so you know, we love that. So are there ways that if I'm not a cult brand today, I can start to associate myself with other maybe cult followings, like with partnerships and stuff? I'm so impressed with what um, you guys most recently, I think, uh, did with the Ted Lasso team. Do you mind talking a little bit about that and maybe we can for some of those conversations. Sure. Yeah, collaborations and brand partnerships is such a fertile space. Is that not me? You all looked simultaneously. I know, yeah. but it wasn't me. Talk about a ritual, holy cow. That's a ritual. <laughs> uh, and we've got a long list of criteria that we, we consider when we're looking at potential partners to work with. Like, we want to work with icons, you know. The second thing we look at is we're looking for somebody who's got a cult-like following with a built-in passion community where if we create something together, new, culture is gonna want it. And it's gonna activate both their customers and our customers too. And it's really one of the fastest way for us to extend our reach into a new audience. And so most recently, like uh, I think, so the Ted Lasso was what? It's a biscuits with the boss flavor? That's correct, yes. yes. And yes. prior to that, some work with Dolly Parton? That's right. And Two very different fan bases, I'm guessing, but I'm curious. Yeah. Like, 
How how thoughtful is all of that? I mean, I'm, very, I'm sure it's thoughtful. Very thoughtful and yeah. intentional. Um, with each of them, it's about it is. the strength of the, the gravitational pull, the deep connection that people have with the show, for example. Uh, when that show aired for the first time, that was at a very dark period of the pandemic, right? And that role, the show, played a role in people's lives uh, at a time when they needed it, too. And so as a result of that, people who were fans would tell their friends about it, and tell their friends about it, and tell their friends about it until they watched it. And that was so, to, to tap into that is such an opportunity. And you can go on eBay right now and buy the Jenny's Ted Lasso shirt that we did for $150 to tie this back to the merch part. Or if you really want it, you can go on and buy the Ted, the uh, Dolly Parton pint that we did for $1,000 on eBay right now. So the collaboration space tied with the merch, limited collectible merch space is mm -hmm. a great place to play in. Wonderful. But why yeah, does that please. work, right? Because it's not about the revenue the companies can generate from that. It's the value your stakeholders have in that item, that ephemera, that moment, that, much be, that might be much more meaningful for them than it is to others, right? And so even like these items and elements, like the Ted Lasso show is incredible. It also helps that Jason Sudeikis loves Jenny's ice cream, right? So that's a slam dunk. But even when we talk about some of the things we have, it's, they, they have no value to us. It shouldn't. You should put them out in this space to see how they react and respond to it. But don't let that lead to like the next revenue opportunity. There's a lot of companies that'll do that, that are built on those moments and they know that they're fleeting and they have to come back to the next one as soon as it carries. But if your audience is really paying attention, right, and wants to be a part of that, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether or not you do it every six months, every 12 months, or every week. The ones that matter, that care, that feel like it is for them are going to pay attention. Yeah. And Jenny's does a great job at that. I mean, they're yeah. a huge Wonderful. mentor for that. Great. Uh, it's Brian's uh, Hot Ones Hot Pocket shirt here is the ultimate flex, too. I'm so jealous. <laughs> Everybody's wearing their brands today. Look at this. This is great. All right, how about questions? Anybody have some questions? We have a little bit of time, even though I took up too much, but no, it's okay. No, no, we're good. Yeah, good. No, 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 it's all good, all good. I, 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 uh, I don't know if we're going to mic it up, but it's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, for Ohio State, how did the landscape change now that athletes are getting cuts from their likeness? Mm -hmm. N-I-L. N-I-L. Yeah, so, uh, na na yeah, sorry, I'll repeat it with the mic on. Is, uh, for Ohio State, now that uh, athletes are getting a cut of licensing, for lack of a better word, how does that change the landscape? Yeah, we, we're just talking about this. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely been a unique situation. Now, our team isn't directly affected by the NIL space precisely. I mean, we do still have interactions with the NIL team and so forth. And, and I mean, it's, it's really the wild, wild rush right now. There's not a lot of guidelines set around it, but, you know, Gene, you know, a big focus of his is, is our student athletes and how do we continue to support them? And we do feel this is a great opportunity for our student athletes. I mean. <laughs> The, as much as they give back to the university, it's, it's, it's a small way that I think they build in this system where, okay, now you can't make money off of what you do and your likeness and everything, which, which I do 100% support. Um, so, you know, Logan Hiddle is, is our director of NIL, and, you know, his task is to really identify opportunities for our student athletes. How do you find these sponsorships, provide them those opportunities, and then give them the roadmap to go ahead and, and work with them on finding those, those areas to connect and, and and then we don't directly negotiate anything. That's all done through the student athletes and through whoever the company is directly. Um, but yes, we will promote, of course, that, that success for our student athletes in NIL space because, I mean, when it comes down to it, recruiting is the number one priority for all of our coaches, getting top recruits to come to, to play our sports here at Ohio State so that way we can always be competitive, always be elite in everything that we do. Uh, so, so NIL is, is always moving. I talk to Logan all the time. and. You know, I asked him, hey, how are things going? He said, I don't know, I'll tell you tomorrow, right? Because he just doesn't physically know new landscape. what's going to happen. Yeah, so the landscape is completely new, but um, I'm sure there will be some regulations that will come around a little bit more with it, but, uh, but right now I think we're, we're trying to navigate as best we can. It just, it's, it's, you know, like I said, it just really comes down to the supporting those student athletes and giving those opportunities right now. So, Cool, yeah, in the back. Yeah, that's a good question. Caitlin Clark is probably the best basketball player I've ever seen play. It's unreal how good she is. Um, because, yeah, you're right, she does transcend across, just not athletics. So, 
Um, you know, I think what we try to do, I mean, Kate Stover is a good example with football right now. I mean, he's really well known for what he does. And I mean, he puts out there that he is a farmer, right? He's, he's a true to a country boy. And, um, you know, we try to look at those opportunities to identify, okay, what, how do our student athletes uh, want to be portrayed? Because the one thing that we try to do, and we can't do that all thousand plus student athletes, but, you know, we do have a team of communicators that we try to find these stories to connect, like I said before, these student athletes with our audience. So that way, as they come to games, as they start to know these student athletes, it's more about just the game itself and understanding their culture and, and who they are as a person. So, um, you know, we, we try to put those stories out there to really drive that connection with our audience. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of our SIDs is really where these stories are coming from. It's, it's try to understand their, their core roots of where they are and then finding those opportunities right now we have a women's ice hockey and a field hockey student athlete. She's doing two sports, which I've never seen that since I've been in Ohio State. I've been here for 16 years, and it's really unique to have a two-sport athlete um, in college. Uh, so, so trying to tell her, her story and understanding what she's going through and everything from um, her class schedule and working with the coaches to really build out a unique training schedule and all these different things, it's, it's really cool to kind of see those opportunities really arise. Um, so, you know... So we really just we really just look to find those opportunities to to tell those stories as best we can. It's, it's interesting when you think about like one of the things that's not in the way of been organizing the charms model is that that personification of the brand, like the singular like ambassador, like a Steve Jobs. They're rare, but what's interesting it just occurred to me is like you've got if you've got a transcend, I mean you've got a churning customer base. He's got a churning. Um, face to the athletic department all the time with all these new students, so trying to figure that out is really, that's probably a really interesting place to keep thinking about. Other questions, please, yeah. yeah hi, um, I work on the Pop-Tarts brand. And oh, great. First, we did a collab with Denny's, and if you haven't tried it, it's amazing. Yep. Brown sugar cinnamon, so I'm laying into that partnership, and it's great. Um, my question is for Brian. So a lot like you, you mentioned kind of your core consumer base is like young teens, so similar issue, and then it kind of drops off once you're 18 Yeah. And the brand. Sure. So similar to Pop Tarts, Hot Pockets, a lot of CPG brands are going through this around your core consumer versus the cyclicality or the nature of who consumes you versus who grocery shops. It's a it's a big problem. I mean, who you want to be. yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. ask any cereals brands, right? Yeah. It's been the, it's been a similar issue. The only way you get past that, and I know this because I've co collaborated with a few people on your team, is you have to give up your understanding of like what is possible or what you think is possible or what your training has taught you and really go deep on the identity of your product, right? Because you know that young kids by and large, or adults, right, young adults are eating your product and you need to think about the next emerging group, the next target, but you can't figure out how to get there through traditional means and vehicles. Your audience will show you how to get there. And so much of what we've done around really understanding that identity of teens is looking at other brands that we could mentor, that we could follow, that weren't in our category, that weren't in our space, that had figured out long before we had. And you've had a couple of them on the screen, Gatorade, Nike, others, we have the exact same issues that realize that in the wakes of culture, in the throes of culture, there's more opportunity and possibility the less you know than the more you seek to understand. And so we relentlessly try to make ourselves uncomfortable with finding individuals who are hyper fandom, will eat our products all the time, that, that rely on them to learn those nuances and think about what's different, to then work with much mm -hmm. smarter people than I to coordinate a stream that at least gets us out into new spaces and territories that might bring people back to the brand, right? Those last, last consumers or look to us in a really fun way. I think what you guys did with Dungeons and Dragons a few years ago um, is a big example of that, where a whole new community was seeking out the products to understand why Pop-Tarts and, and Dungeons and Dragons, why this with this thing that I love. And if you're doing it authentically, there's a high likelihood you're gonna keep them much higher than you would traditional shopper programs or those types of things. Great question. Other questions? All right. Oh, there's one in the back. What would the panelists consider rising cult brands right now that they look at? I'll let you guys go first, but I have one. Liquid it's probably death. the same one. Liquid death. That's what I was going to say, liquid death. They've done an incredible job. If you don't know their story, look it up. Um, Mike is a wild dude, but what he was able to build with that brand, with that audience, and his just relentless pursuit about trying to create a brand that could act and live like a beer brand, 
but B, net benefit, right? Something that was better for the environment, better for the body, and just giving up to let it go is yep. unbelievable. And then he armed himself with people from other mentor brands like PBR, different agencies around the country yep. to shepherd and steward it in a way where their relentless pursuit is virality and culture. They don't think about anything else. And that alignment internally from the top down is why you've seen them really have a meteoric sure, rise over the last three years. It's, it's insane. Skyrocketing, uh, clearly with an idea of building a cult following. Um, they act like a cult brand. I don't know if they actually have a cult following yet, but they certainly are. Well, they do. Yeah, yeah. they're certainly building, they're building towards that. Yeah. Others that you guys, that was the question, was any uh, others that you guys see coming? Well, or, or that you I mean, Air, may see in a dollar. I don't know, Airbnb, I think is one that's always yeah. unique to me just because um, that, that sense of belongingness and that sense of connectivity is, is how they, how well they connect their, their commercials with their audiences where it's, it's not just, you know, when they first started, here's a home and here's a place to live or here's a place to rent. Now it's about the experience that you create and having their audience create that for them. You see all the commercials all, all the time where it's just the experience that they're, that they're providing their, their consumers, it's unique and, and something different that it's, it's not about just the product, but it's about what you can create and what you feel and how you feel. So to me, that's always a, a really cool one that they're really starting to, 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 really to change out. Um, their new rebrand of Belong Anywhere, I mean, is a really cool tagline, and I think that really resonates with, with their brand. I would say Tyler, the creator's brand, Golf the Floor. Uh, it's so unique, such, like, it's, it's his, his point of view. Nobody else could do what he's doing. It's a platform for both fashion, for fragrance, for, for music, and the strength of the connection that his fans have is off the charts. Fantastic. Other question? Rick, Rick has a question. Probably. First of all, I apologize for cutting you off. No, please. <laughs> it was a Tesla example. I'll show it to you later. It'll be uh, fine. It <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to come back to the yeah. charm, since we have some minutes, I don't know if we still can. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I think it's a hard question. I'm just sitting here thinking about it and thinking about who we have in the audience. A lot of folks from the insurance industry or financial services and service lines things that are not necessarily pop culture already naturally as horses or a certain food or, or such. So maybe we can't become the cult, but how do we get cult-like uh, 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 attributes when you're that kind of company? What do you do? When you think ahead, Peyton Manning, what do you think of? There you go. Nationwide is on your side, right? Like there's very real things that brands that can't understand the identity or, or being culturally relevant, what you can do from affinity of others, that works. It's how progressive, if you've heard their former CMO talk, like love him to death, yeah. the Cleveland Creative, golf, great guy. Like Flo had something that made people uncomfortable but could serve as a conduit between cultures and spaces. So often it's what you need to really be have that cult following. It's not about what you have as a service, but what these audiences and what these cohorts can truthfully unlock for you through that meaningful association. I think it's that. I also think that what, what Brian's just saying is um, a lot of what we're talking about today is what can I create in the world? What can I put out in the world? And sometimes your service or your product isn't necessarily the thing. It's how you talk about it. How creative can you be with it? What kind of an idea can you put out in the world that comes back to you? You say flow. I say I love the insight around I don't want to be my parents, uh, that whole campaign. Uh, I mean, I smile at every single one of those because it's true. And it makes me like that company so much better. Um, and then I think the other uh, uh, the other aspect of it is how do you f how do you serve your customers? So you are in service industries and all of these things. So I think now it's it's still a it's a retailer, but like uh, Lance and I were talking the other day about Chewy. So they sell um, you know pet supplies, but they are famous for how they take care of their customers. That's what they're famous for. You can get the stuff anywhere. But the idea that they, they send bereavement flowers if they find out that your, your pet has died, or they take care, you, they're using data, they're using their shopper and first party data to figure out what's going on with this person and their pet, and how can we be of service to them? How can we create empathy for them in a way that distinguishes them from all other brands? And I'm telling you, people who, have, who like Chewy love Chewy because of those kinds of things. I don't know if there's other things you guys might say. Any conversation about cold brands would be incomplete without mentioning the prerequisite of radical obsession with the customer experience, right? And then, and how you want people to feel. For us, 
it's, it's about the ice cream, but it's not about the ice cream. It's about what we help people to do, what the ice cream helps people to do, too. So that can translate to insurance, if you think about that. Yeah. One more, yeah, please. Off the top of mind, I think when I think of like younger, younger generation, I have young adult children, um, they seem um, much more in tune and interested in the values and the priorities of the organizations that they come home from. Um, and I just wonder how you think about that or are you thinking about that um, and how that kind of plays out in the planning? Every day. Yeah, the values of the next consumer generation, Gen Z specifically, but Gen Alpha is going to be a whole yeah. other degree or level. Um, they don't have brand love. They don't have brand equity built into what they do. They are driven by purpose, meaning, and intent. And so it becomes very hard when you see things that they don't align with where they just cut off their habits, right? Well, be it limited spending, but it is the next great, I would say, group of spending that we have. Luxury brands are struggling with this right now. It's the reason why you have companies like Gucci partner with Xbox yes. to make a $10,000 case with $300 worth of goods in order to get that association because it's not about Gucci of old, but pushing themselves into spaces like gaming. Swarovski Crystal now sponsors every major esports tournament and their trophies for what they can bring much faster than anybody else. None of these kids really know that that's who's making it. But when they look back and they start to go a level deeper, they understand that, which might then get you that love, that equity and further I downstream. I can't remember the partnership, but just like that one, North Face is partnering with one of the fashion brands to create. Fa Gucci. Is it Gucci, Gucci also? Gucci, so yeah. Gucci's all over it. Like they're trying to figure out how do I make my brand relevant in different kinds of experiences and ways yeah. that wouldn't be the traditional way or the you know I don't have the disposable but it's not income. Just the, yep. the partnership or the marketing, like, there's story to that. There's, yeah, there's sure. depth. As much as like, a bunch of media partners will tell you that you know, decisions are made in less than three seconds. You gotta have your brand up front on your TikTok ads or your Facebook ads. There are those consumers that wanna go to YouTube, that wanna go to your brand page, that wanna understand this story because that $100, $200, $300 purchase might mean the world to them, but then downstream is the reason they stay, the reason they believe, especially if you continue to deliver. And so it's a challenge because you have to, especially in consumer products, you have to understand that the internet does not forget. It might be a society of goldfish, but they will remember the things that have happened. And so you have to make solid decisions as you navigate through, or when you mess up, own it. Because if you don't, that lack of genuineness, that lack of being real about the situation or transparency is enough to get you. Fantastic. Cool. All right, any more questions before I give you a gift? All right, I'm gonna give you a gift. One more secret. So I don't have, I, clearly, I didn't have time to do everything I wanted to do. I couldn't give you this one either. So I want you guys to uh, scan this baby when you get a chance. This is a six-minute origin, creed, history, uh, mark, symbols, and secrets video for um, Johnny Walker's brand. Um, it is everything we've just talked about wrapped up in a six-minute video with a single camera shot it's a master class in everything we're talking about telling the story. Oh. Uh, oh, somebody already downloaded it. Good job. So anyway, uh, those of you who have already seen it, um, watch it again in this context, because you will be able to recognize all the things we talked about today literally laid out in there in an, in an exceptional uh, creative expression. Um, and with that, I want to thank all of you guys for coming in today. I really thought this was a, a great discussion, and we're all hanging out. All right. Thank Beautiful. you. You bet. Thanks, guys. <laughs>